Hello everyone, welcome to today's Water Cooler Chat where we talk about all things live peer, whether it's orchestrating, delegating, or broadcasting. Um, today we're going to be going through a couple of things in the community. So uh, we'll start off with introductions, and if you have a topic, please share it and we'll uh, go through them together. So I will start. Uh, I am Titan, been running the Titan Node Orchestrator uh, pool for since May of 2021. And today my topic is um, winning tickets. Um, I see that winning tickets have changed in value, and some are not. Some are not showing up in the uh, uh, the orchestrator uh, winning ticket bot. So I'm kind of curious about that. Um, and I'm sure we'll talk about a little bit about the uh, change reward cut and fee cuts um, that. Uh, if you guys have seen in, in Discord, uh, someone's been changing their reward cuts immediately after getting new stake, so it's been interesting. Um, and then obviously I'm gonna jump into the performance and reliability board, the reliability and performance board um, later on. Um, we might as well use some time here to, to go through that together. Those are my topics. Um, ben, would you like to introduce yourself on a topic? Hey guys, I'm Ben. Been running the Authority Null Node since November ish last year. Um, don't really have a topic today, but I definitely want to add some input to the performance and reliability board. Very cool. Thank you for joining us. Chase Media, would you like to introduce yourself and a topic? Everyone, it's um, Rebecca here with Chase Media. Been running the node since about February, but um, been learning a lot through the Titan Node um, scheme, I guess it is. Um, I don't really have a topic. I just wanted to chime in and say hello to everyone because I haven't haven't been on here for a bit and um, hear what the uh, what the week is uh, is in, is unfold, unfolding for us. So yeah, thanks for having me. Very cool. Thank you so much for joining us, Papa Bear. Would you like to introduce yourself and a topic? Sure, I am Papa Bear, and I've been running the Solar Farm Orchestrator for a year now, and. Um, I don't know if it's really a topic, but something that um, I've noticed, and I think I've heard other people mention it too, is it seems like there's always uh, like one, at least one ingest node that's down, and it seems like it's almost like a rolling thing. Like one will go down, and another one comes up, or one gets fixed, and then another one goes down. I was wondering if anyone has any insight uh, to whether that's a planned thing or part of the way the protocol is supposed to work, or um, just if coincidental thing um or if anyone else has noticed it not noticed it so um there's that and then i i listened to part of the performance and reliability um uh call but i was driving and just had stuff going on so i really only got bits and pieces so i'm really curious to hear more about uh, uh that uh what, what you guys came up with in there very cool. Yes, I think we're going to, I'm hoping to spend like maybe the second half of this on that performance reliability board because I think it's a pretty big item and I think it's worth um, worth figuring out as soon as possible so we can get started on it. Um, I'll actually just share it in chat once Google Docs wants to actually load for me. So thank you so much for joining us, Papa Bear. Um, John with Elite Encoder, would you like to introduce yourself on a topic? Hey, this is John. I've been running Elite Encoder since last October. A um, couple of I, topics I'd like to talk about today. Uh, I've been trying to get an orchestrator and two transcoder processes running behind the same IP address. Um, I don't know if anyone's had any success with that. Um, I, you know, maybe just talk about uh, what what type of configuration for that works. If anyone's familiar with that. Um, some other topics, um, I've seen New York City, the new NYC test streams have been failing consistently. Uh, we recently moved over to some 1070 graphics cards, and since then, it seems to have, to have been an issue. Um, though performance has been good. Uh, and then if we have any time, uh, we'll like talk about different configurations for Portainer orchestration. Retainer. Very cool. I like it. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, but just to clarify, you said you, you had two T's and one O behind the same IP address? Yeah, that's what I was trying to do with testnet and, and have had no success with that. Very good. Okay, cool. So, well, 
just just to be clear, that's running everything locally on a single machine. That's what that that's another way of saying what you're trying to do. Yes. Basically, yeah, yeah. So you could just normally run live peer as just a regular OT uh, without separate transcoding processes. But I guess the requirement would be if you had one graphics card with different requirements, you might want to run two different transcoding processes. And that, no, it totally totally makes sense what you're trying to do. I just wanted to make sure that that was that I was understanding correctly. Um, yeah, I think I I think some of us has figured that out. So we'll chime in, and I'm sure we'll get through it. So thank you sure. so much for joining us, Elite Encoder. Pon, would you like to introduce yourself on the topic? Hi guys, can you hear me now? Yes, oh, I'm still struggling. Yeah. yeah. All right, I'm Pon. I've been here since April. Uh, I don't I don't have a specific topic, but I think it's a lot of discussions going around about fees and everything else. So we noticed that uh, winning tickets are less than 0 0.01 ETH. So it just was like interesting to see. And I'm running like a max face value of 0 0.01 ETH and it wasn't getting any tickets in the meantime while the fees were low. Very cool. Yeah, uh, things have changed quite a bit, so we can definitely jump into that. Thank you so much for joining us, Pon. Uh, Kelv Prez, Kelv Prez, would you like to introduce yourself on a topic? Hey everyone, uh, this is Kelvin. I'm reaching out with, uh, I'm from Bubble Maps team. The Bubble Maps is a new auditing supply tool uh, for any DeFi tokens and NFTs. Uh, I reached out uh, through the main channel to see if we can set up a live peer and showcase your tokenomics and token distribution in a live, uh, you know, on date uh, performance, per se. And that's, uh, yeah, I would like to uh, showcase it um, later on as we go, if you, if you can. And if I can, uh, basically uh, display your token distribution and explain a little more about bubble maps. Very cool. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, Kelv. Um, yeah, I think we were talking in uh, the general chat there, and, and what you had posted was, was really, really cool. Um, for those of you who didn't see it, I would really recommend checking out... Um, Kelv, can, can you put a link to what you put in Discord there in the general chat into the water cooler side chat, just two channels above us, just to give people context um, around what, um, what you're working on? Um, and then what we'll do is later on in the conversation, we'll, we'll jump around back to you and uh, we'll dig a little deeper. If that's all right. Sounds good. Cool. We'll do that. Sounds yeah, good. Uh, Ryan, would you like to introduce yourself on a topic? My name's Ryan. Uh, I go by Night Node. Um, I have no topic. I'm just here to listen. But uh, yeah. Very cool. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, cool. And then I see we just have a couple more people uh, in the audience, which uh, is all cool. You guys can just sit back and listen if you'd like. Otherwise, I've invited you up to stage where you can uh, chime in on the discussion and uh, ask questions. All right. I uh, need a few minutes. Okay, there we go. Okay, let's get started. All right. Well, um, let's just start off with Elite Encoders uh, topic, uh, which is uh, technical. Uh, because I think today is going to be mostly a technical discussion. Um, and then hopefully in, in about 45 minutes, we can jump right into the reliability and the performance board. Um, so, uh, Elite Encoder, tell us what you're trying to do with your two T's, one O, multiple T's set up, where you're having problems, what your current configuration is. Yeah. Um, so current configuration, uh, I, we moved over to two 1070s. Um, and we've got an O and one transcoder process on the same system. Um, so that way we can plug in additional transcoders. Um, one of the nice ideas I had was if we could have multiple boxes in our same you know, little data center there and you know add transcoders to that so we could have three or four boxes and each box have a transcoder on it, you could extend those GPUs instead of adding riser cards and things like that. Um, so that was one of the use cases um, another one was just to have, you know, the O process and then two T processes in the same box. Um, the idea behind that being we had seen a, a 
different areas over time where I guess a lot of streams would come in at once and you get orchestrator busy. We're hoping that by having more transcoding processes that that would get spread out to the other transcoders and less like likelihood of having any kind of uh, overload from that coming in. Um, so it was, it was a bit of an experimental idea, but it was also a scalability um, strategy. Uh, but so far as I've tried to do it, uh, what happens is it seems like the two transcoding processes are are trying to either, if you run them on the same box, it seems like if you could send a stream to one, you know, one stream in, it'll go to one transcoder. The other stream, when it starts going to the second one, um, it seems that both transcoders start receiving the results or trying to get results from each other and they get mixed up. Um, now I had both T's hooked to like localhost IP. Um, 127.0.0.1, then the O was on service address. But wasn't sure if anyone had, had tried that or had found any ways it worked. I've read something about a hairpin net and all kinds of crazy things, but um, I've just been playing with test net because it's so far this setup has been pretty unpredictable. Um, but, the, but the regular O and T process work, work out fine. You can add as many GPUs in the same box with that. Oh, well, that's you, where I'm at with it. Have you, by chance, tried any older versions of Live Peer? Uh, because I, I remember running two 1070s on my New York node, just on native Linux, and uh, I believe Ryan has done it as well, since he shares a, a New York server with me. Um, and we we never had any issues with running T's locally to an O that's also local. Uh, so I'm wondering if it's maybe a an issue with the newest versions of, of live peer or if something else is going on. You know, I tried this months ago and it and still had had the same issue. I remember the same errors I saw in the logs. Um, I mean, you know, to be clear today, we do, you know, we just moved over to, it is technically a remote T configuration, but it's all local. Um, it's just one T process that has you know, two GPUs running on it. Uh, what I was wanting to move towards was like two transcoding processes with just one GPU on each process. Right, which um, should should work. So I'm okay. I'm, I'm lost. Has anyone else had success Probably. doing that recently? I'm I'm sorry. Could you just give me like a quick recap onto what the actual issue you're having with that is? I might I was only partially listening. Yeah, the uh, the error seems. So if I send one stream, so let's say I have an O and two Ts on localhost, both. Mm -hmm. Each key is connected to its own GPU. Um, what I see is there seems to be like a networking issue. When the second stream comes in, I start getting this error. Um, it says like waiting on headers as it tries to get each segment oh. back. Okay. It, it's kind of not, I could send the specific error in the chat later. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, sorry. I, th I thought you were mentioning some, a different error that I would actually know about. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't know. We 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 don't have any of those issues for some reason. Uh, ports on on everything are different, right? For each process, for the CLI address. You know, when I run it on one two seven, like the local host, it hmm. so the the orchestrator address is always the same, right? But once it once it connects, it comes up with its own port number when you run hmm. it locally. But if I run it from an external IP, even in within the network. Um, it seems to try to stick to that service address port. And, the, uh, if uh, I do client, it that way, I... the the client address port you're doing like seven nine four five seven nine five five the port right? Yeah, the CLI port I've I've iterated that too, so there's okay. no conflicts there. Um, but yeah, this service address uh, seems to be where the issue is, like the service port. So the transcoders obviously have the same. I guess uh, service address port as the orchestrator. It seems like when they're all behind the same IP, the, the traffic just gets all mixed up. Um, you set it, the um, sorry on your O. Are you setting your? Uh, I don't have a config file right in front of me, but um, Titan, I think you said to reduce latency. You set it as like uh, the IP address or the service URI, as opposed to the. Um, as opposed to like your domain name, right? So you're just doing like an IP address. Um, yeah. So I, are you, are you, yeah, exactly. 
uh, John, are you your service address for your O is just the a local machine IP address, correct? Uh, it's not the local machine IP. Um, what is it's, it? It's the public IP. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. That's oh, I, I, I think you right, right. Are you behind? You're behind a router then. Right. Okay. So you're yeah. Okay. Okay. So that doesn't matter. So your your router's pointing the port to the machine. So you're using that IP address. Now, okay, but then you're using your your T's when you specify the service address for your T's. Are you specifying it as the IP address, or are you specifying it as, as localhost? Yeah, yeah, I'm using one two seven IP. Okay, you should use you should use your public address. Public, okay. Try for the for the T's as the orchestrator address. Yeah, use use the use the service address that your t yeah you because what's going to happen, I believe, is when your T tries to connect, it it's going. I uh, there might be a conflict there, but from any time I've experimented with T's, and I, I've got lots of T's out in the world, um, uh, you you really should keep the service address the same on the t the o as the t's um oh okay i i i just i kind of disagree there because if you're doing any sort of load balancing you want your service address to be the domain not the ip on your o and i haven't noticed any noticeable um latency increase from doing that the only issue is when trying to connect remote T's, there seems to be some conflict with load balancing if you have the domain name set. But but really, if you're not using the domain name as your service address, and, and Mike uh, Zuper can, can go into detail on this if he wants, but if you're not using the domain name as your IP address, you lose all functionality of load balancing that your uh, like Cloudflare or AWS gives you. You know, if, if my EU node goes down, streams are going to automatically go to to London. If my domain if it's not my domain name, that's not gonna happen. So in theory that should work. I don't know if that's a problem with live peer or if it's just the way Cloudflare and AWS handles these things, but But I will say I think you're talking about the discovery request though, not the actual transcoding job. Right? No, I I'm no, I'm talking about the actual transcoding job. If if you're using the domain name as the service address and something happens to that server and Cloudflare or AWS sees that something has happened to that server, it's going to automatically mark that server as down because everything's, all of your O's are using the domain name. It's going to go to the next nearest O. Your streams are going to go to your next nearest O, so you won't miss a test stream because it will just go to London instead of EU or whatever. And your, your EU streams will now go to the London node because that's the next available node that you have and everything is using a domain name. Right. So, so what you're saying is instead of just having the domain for the discovery request and then having it switch over to the IP address to be static, you're saying that if that O goes down, you want it to remain on the I, uh, the domain so that if it goes down again, it'll switch to a whole different orchestrator altogether. Is that correct? Yeah, because, because every O that's linked with Cloudflare AWS is using the same service address. Mm. and those services already know geographically where each of those IPs are because you've set that up, right? With Cloudflare or AWS or whatever you're using. Yeah. I, 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 yeah, theoretically, I guess that would work. I've just had issues where I've tried load balancing with a domain and T's that connect to O's just get really messed up unless you can obviously figure that out. But yeah, that's so that's what the I created a ticket for as well. Was there is some weirdness there, but I don't know if you know that's anything LivePair can do. That might just be the functionality of of Cloudflare and other load balancers that are just messing it up when you try to connect T's from from different regions. But that that's a whole other issue. Yeah, that's I think that's a whole different issue than what. Uh... Yeah, that's very interesting. Yeah, I put some notes uh, the logs in the chat as far as like. What I had gotten, these probably are from the exact same times, but they were from different tests I'd ran 
with with test nets to kind of get an idea of what the O and the T was was trying to say. Um, like I said, the first the first T was doing fine with its one stream, and then as soon as the second one came in, they started getting all mixed up back and forth. And you get this client dot timeout. Uh, it seemed like it was trying to download the segments and it was failing. But these are just my test net for broadcasters and IPs and everything. Oh, that's interesting. I have a question. I'm oh, hmm. sorry. Go ahead. Uh, I, I just if oh, I was just wondering. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, have you tried um, the setup, but connecting to a remote, um, like a, like like a physically remote um, orchestrator? Because you have two orchestrators, right? Yeah, like you, I, I can. Yeah. The, the I, reason I I'm asking that, yeah. <laughs> is because I run actually a lot of transcoders that connect to remote um, orchestrators, and mm -hmm. I run separate instances for. Um, all, I mean, on, on some machines, I have four different like transcoders running that are going to yeah. a single T, and it works no problem. I haven't done it actually locally, so I don't know if there, like there's differences there. Thank but you I'd for be that. curious yeah. to know if it works remotely, then we can like start to try and hone in on what is going on with just the uh, you know is the problem something that's related to it being all local um, versus just another issue because I don't do anything special. I mean, I don't have to make a separate data directory or anything like that. I mean, I've got yeah. On this one machine here, I've got like five T's running and they're going to, you know, multiple different O's and some some have, you know, multiple T's going to certain, o, you know, to, to a single O. So, um, and none of them have nice. any issues. So I'd be curious okay. to know if, if just like as a test, if it works, if you're connecting to a remote one and then we can start trying to plan around with things like, you know, the service address and things like that, if it, it does work um, uh, just uh, to a... a physically remote though yeah i appreciate that that's good insight because that was one thing i thought about trying and i just haven't given that a try yet and um from what i could tell i think that's probably the issue um so i'll try to separate the the o from the t's on a different ip and um, that should work i think might help just like like figure out exactly like which you know what what parameters are like there's just a one thing like they like people were talking about you know is it the service address needs to be this or um, you know, should it be local host versus, you know, an IP address, things like that. Um, yeah, it was curious because I, I know Titan had given like a demonstration one time about, you know, the dip, the advantage of having everything on one box, you know, how the oak talks to the T and then sends the, the data from the T back to the O and to the broadcaster. And so based off that architectural idea, um, I thought this would work, but it seems like the T has to have an open port it almost looks like it's trying to connect back in, but I, I don't know. I'll I'll give that a try though. Thank you. That's that's really good insight. Um, I think that'll work. We may even set up two IPs in the same location just for uh, just yeah. For I mean the, that, that would extra be speed. Anything. Yeah, I mean that would that would probably be the equivalent uh, as far as uh, mm -hmm. as far as testing goes. Just to that. Um, but yeah, I'd be curious to know if that works. If if not, and if that doesn't work, then there's something else going on um, aside from yeah. just uh, the setup. So um, hey, uh, I'll, I'll put it on a VPS and report back. Uh, curious though, your manifest ID is Citizen Media on your T, but your manifest ID on your O is manifest yeah. Citizen Media. Is it... These are just totally different logs. I'm sorry, I was just okay. Trying running through the logs really quick okay um, uh, the, the other thing is your, your port is different it's 8934 on the t and it's 8933 on the o it, is, is that correct or is yeah, that that's a good point um i don't know I, i'd mix that up a lot uh yeah i'll have to go through and get some better test uh, logs to show you that's a good point i'm pretty sure i had them correct um i was testing across two different machines so i was using different ports for a while there yeah, you might have con like, I don't know if it's possible to have conflicting ports, but when you run, yeah, I think they were right. If you're running different T's, they should create just a wholly different port that separates them. Got it. Okay. Yeah, I know. At one time, I had I was trying to do it like said to spread it apart, like have um, one box do the transcoding, the other do the orchestrating, but they're still behind the same public IP. Um, and that's probably why you see some variations there. But also, these logs aren't from the same timestamp, so I tried all kinds of stuff. Um, yeah, I, I've had I guess base. I've had success with 
them not being on the same machine, like but on behind the same router. So the O is behind on a so I had like a really old shitty computer that had no GPUs in it from like 2010, and I was running an O on it, standalone O. And then I had a bunch of PCs in my house that I could connect to it with as a T, and it worked fine. Um, but okay. so those were separate. And use yeah, the local I, IP or the um, orchestrator. Address? I use this orchestrator address. Okay. A few like few the months ago, address. I I, uh, I had it working with just the uh, local host address on a Linux box in New York, and then just last week I had two uh, RTX four thousands in Chicago in Docker uh, running remote on for a for a local O, and that worked as well. So I don't I don't know if Docker helped with that or. Or what? Yeah, yeah. I was thinking that might help. I haven't got to that point yet with it, but it's a good, it's a good idea. You can have private subnets internally. It might help with the routing a bit. Um, now, Titan, when you had that separate box doing the transcoding, did you have any other transcoders behind the same way on the same network? Uh, I just yeah, like I said. I just had the, the standalone T on a box and then all the transcoders were in different boxes. But behind the same standalone O you had and then multiple yeah. T's. Yeah. Right. Okay. So okay. Okay. same thing as if it was on just one machine, right? I ran one standalone process mm -hmm. of the O and then you'd run a T behind it. Theoretically, I thought that would work just the same. So I don't know. Why. Yeah, yeah, it should. Maybe we can get a working session together sometime. Mm. I always bring technical topics in here. Well, it's a good idea because if we switch, I don't know if it's in the up in the next release, but we're supposed to, or I don't know if it's even happening. I haven't looked. But we're supposed to have the max O session, just the sum of the connected T sessions, right? Yeah, that would be nice. And so... You know, I, I've noticed that mine's been doing that. Uh, well, I, I don't... Actually, I don't know how it all gets displayed, but I just noticed on my Grafana, like if I connect sometimes two T's to an orchestrator, it'll like it it changes the my capacity on on the Grafana panel. I don't know if that maybe it's just the way I, I'm pulling the data from uh, how many uh, sessions I can handle. So I don't, I don't know because I still have my max sessions set in my orchestrator, but I noticed that like I'll connect a second T if I notice like stuff's getting busy, and then it'll like. It, it reflects in, in, in my microphone panel. So I don't know if it's, it, I mean, I've never gotten to the point where more streams than I, than my max sessions is coming in, but um, I probably figure out a way to try and test that. Yeah. I think there was a pull request to, or at least a, an issue to have the, the max T, the yeah, max. I think I, think, I think I made that a while back. Well, I think and and what's his name? Um, uh, who oh, I does, made the issue. Someone, the I, bug, think, I did see someone was working on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah the bug fix Friday there. Um, Tom, was it Tom? Tom, yeah, Tom. I think worked on that, and so I think I think it might be like that's what I mean. Like I I don't know if it's released in this release or it's coming up in the next release, but we could stop using the max session limit on the O's. And we can just set it on the T's, and the O's will just pick up the amount of, because like from a pool perspective, is like what am I going to do? Shut down my O's to increase my max session limit? Like that's ridiculous. Uh, so I mean, if, you could set you could set it to some outrageous number, like a million. But well, that's what I did. It's set like oh. to to thousands. But then what happens is instead of the transcoder. Instead of the orchestrator that receives too many streams, instead of it saying, "Hey, listen, orchestrator, busy, um, please go somewhere else," it like internally tries to figure it out, and then it's like uh, not enough transcoders. So I don't know if the area. The, the thing is, I don't even know if I don't know how the the errors differ. I just thought it was cleaner to, you know, but yeah, no, my, I just have it arbitrarily set high. And sometimes I only have two sessions, five sessions. Like on my Singapore node, for instance, I have only three sessions available, right? But my Singapore O accepts 2,000 uh, sessions arbitrarily. And so when I get up to five, you know, what happens, right? Like it's like, like 
is it kicking out other sessions? Like what what what's it actually doing? I don't actually know, right? Um, in the past, actually, now I'm thinking about it. Um, there was a time where um, I had an orchestrator set um, to um, higher number of sessions than the transcoder was set to, and it was sending more sessions to that transcoder than the transcoder was set to uh, to handle. I don't know what version that was on. It might have been like a version or two ago, but um, so it was so, something wasn't working right as far as like respecting uh, which which uh, number. But, uh, it, it wasn't it wasn't respecting the 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 uh, orchestrator's max session limit the transcoder max session or the orchestrator max session it, the orchestrator it was actually sending more streams than the orchestra like the orchestrator if it was set to uh like uh, sorry the orchestrator was set to let's uh let's say six and the transcoder was set to 10 it was sending like i was getting like eight streams on the transcoder so it was sending more streams than the orchestrator had set as its max session yeah well, there you go. Then who cares about that set, that setting? <laughs> well, I mean, well, I, I kind of wonder, like, you know, like, yeah, it would it would make a lot more sense for it to just total up the the uh, the uh, the value based off of the the transcode, uh, well, the transcoders uh, yeah. values. Does anyone know if the if like an orchestrator will move streams from one transcoder session to another transcoder? internally like if it experiences any issues with one or is it more likely to just move to a whole other orchestrator yes Titan says it will and i've played with it and i haven't seen that behavior myself but i haven't really like gone deep into that yeah so wh when papa bear was offline there on my pool for a bit i have two transcoders in the same house um so i was testing that out so what would happen is um I would have one session on one machine, no, none on the other. I would physically, I would close down the um, transcoder um, window, so like that had the session, S and yeah. you, you get you get the error that says completing segments closing down, right? And so what it's actually doing is it is transcoding the last segment, and then it's sending some sort of message saying hey listen I've, I've closed down and i've exited the map well that orchestrator in la got that message and then immediately switched to my other transcoder and it picked up on this the exact next temp file and continued on that's awesome that's oh, yeah. so it, there you go if you manually close it though if you are um, uh, not in real time, I believe that won't be the case because this is where I've been trying to experiment with max attempts, uh, the max attempts flag, um, which I still can't quite figure out. But it's basically, I believe what happens is your orchestrator by default sets it to three where it says, I'm going to, I'm going to wait, I'm going to attempt three times to get this transcoded segment back and in three times if I don't get it back I'll switch transcoders but I think by time your trans your orchestrator attempts three times I think the broadcaster gives up on the orchestrator first and then it switches orchestrators so then I was experimenting with one max attempt um, with the orchestrator and I haven't quite figured that one out yet because I don't know how to make a transcoder run sub real time to figure out if it'll switch between transcoders before the broadcaster leaves. So yeah, these. So if you if you if you if you actively shut down a real time transcoder, it'll switch. And that's why in my pool software, in my video for my advertisement, I tell people that they can kind of just join and leave when they want. Like if it's if it's if it's mm -hmm. noon, you can spin up a node, you can start transcoding, and when you're done, like yeah, you can just exit. You can just turn off your computer. It'll just hand out the streams to the other transcoders. So what a lot, what my idea was was that more streams during dinner time. Well, more kids are gaming, and so there's just the supply and the demand literally rise and fall based on general usage of PCs anyway. 
So the idea that people can come and go is the right move. So that was my theory behind all that. That's a very good observation. And it, it basically works like a load balancer to a certain degree, you know? Um, so I, I, I think it's a good idea to point out that functionality and might be able to leverage that. It's a good reason to run multiple transcoding processes instead of just a, one process as an OT. Yeah. So, um, but I only experienced that when, like I said, when you shut it down and the node right. says, it gives you the message, closing down, waiting to, you know, finishing transcoding the last segment, and then it sends, you know, leaving map, and, and it's clean and right. clear and under control, you know? Like okay. the, like the yeah, makeup. Yeah, it may not work for all those error cases. Yeah. Okay. So that, that's been my I'll experience. That. that That's also why, like, Load balancing between transcoders that, that should be just done in the orchestrator software to begin with. Um, yeah, I would agree. Yeah, that'd be great functionality to have. So, it seems it seems pretty smart. Like people coming and going from the pool doesn't seem to be. Um, I don't think that's been my issue with like drop segments and things of this nature. Actually, kicking out people using Wi-Fi, I think, has been... We'll, we'll see in the next week. I'll report back whether that was, like, a big change. Because, yeah, that was... Uh, yeah, there's a lot of people in my pool that were transcoding over Wi-Fi. Uh, How did you detect... Do you use something to detect... Oh, sorry. How do you detect that? If so, Is it just based on latency, or do you actually look for hardware? Or I guess uh, there's hardware a Python. Data. There's a Python plugin that tells you what connection they're using. And so gotcha. it reads your device and tells you whether it's Ethernet or Wi-Fi. Nice. And so, which took a frickin' forever to figure out. Um, but I'm unsure, and this is the problem I had with the ping module. Or not the ping module, but my original idea about ping was I have to make sure that it, it comes back in English because if it comes back in, like, a different language, then... But I think Ethernet and Wi-Fi are like multi, like, like there's no different word for Wi-Fi in different languages, I don't think. You're asking the wrong person. <laughs> I, I know on Linux, it's like IW config or if config, there is some little interface name for it in Windows, I'm not too sure. I haven't figured out, I haven't figured out how to det like, um, how to detect um, connections on Linux. I just did it for Windows. Oh. I, you can on Linux. I know yeah. you can. I just figured people you use you running Linux boxes are probably hardwired in. So just just an assumption. I'm making. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's going to cover most of my Windows. By the time I spend 12 hours trying to figure out how to um, keep people on Linux out of Wi-Fi, like, I'm pretty sure most people on Linux boxes are, are hardwired in. Yeah. People running Linux boxes on my pool are definitely not the problem. So. Side note, just <laughs> I don't I don't know what I mean. I, I know you I know you uh, you use what is it fast dot com for your uh, speed test, um, but I, I don't know why I get the worst like test times or like scores ever with you as far I mean it doesn't matter really, but like I'm just always surprised at how low my score is when I, in, like in fact when I upgraded because I saw that. Uh, uh, the new version was out i you know uh, installed it uh, you know uh, restarted and it, it, i had a first time an upload speed of nine megabits per second which uh i know i'm doing better than that so i mean just and just then again just running it right afterwards was fine so i don't know why i just have like the worst luck with uh, the score or that the speed that i get with your speed test but i i, I uh, switched to uh speed test oh interesting yeah. Usually with them, I, I get pretty good scores. Yeah. But um, anyways, uh, I, just had to, <laughs> I just had to throw that in there because I was like nine, nine megabits. Because <laughs> it's, it's the first time I've ever seen like you, you're, you're, I got the message, you know, you're too slow. Sorry, you can't uh, be in the pool. And I was like, wait, what? Nine megabits. Yeah, that's speed, oh. that's speed test oh. uh, yeah. I, I, I mean, think um, I talking to a guy who says that speed test.net actually throttles people's connections based on how much IP uh, providers will will pay them so that they'll switch providers 
and that's their business wow. model. So apparently speedtest.net is like a corrupt, <laughs> like, they, <laughs> like you don't actually want to use them. Um, but the thing is they have a Python plugin that like literally just works. And so I figured rather than me trying to pick a quote unquote more reliable speed testing authority, I was like, listen. You're just trying to get a basic idea. You just, you know, like, you just want to make sure. Speed I'm going to go ahead and just say speed test on that is going to be fine for what I need it for. But yeah, it does. It does weird things. They're not, it's not the best, but. Yeah. Um, yeah, it wasn't. I, I was just taking a stab at you for I don't know for no reason. Well, I had people. I had people in the pool saying that uh, they also. They're like, wait, I have eight hundred megabits uploaded. It says I only have like a ninety. How dare they? And I was like, or like, yeah. how, how dare your pool? I'm like, bro, that's just speedtest.net's Python API. Like, I don't, I don't have any control over that. Like, I just take their word for it. All good. More people you scare away, more work for me. Yeah, I've just decided to set my bench marking really high. Like, I just don't, like, like, yeah. I, I just, it's so hard to keep performance high in this, like, uh, how to create a high-performing pool is definitely a bit difficult task. Um, I'm going to switch over a little bit to uh, to uh, Kelv because um, we've been at this for about 45 minutes, and I'm curious about bubble maps. So um, if you haven't done so already, head over to the water cooler side chat, and you'll see the bubble maps uh, uh, link. Um, Kelv, do you want to talk a little bit about um, what you've built here, what you're working on, and how uh, it might integrate with Livebeer? Yes, of course. Uh, so basically, uh, like I mentioned to you guys earlier, uh, Bubble Maps is a new auditing tool for any DeFi token and NFTs. And uh, what this basically allows you to see is uh, all the data related uh, may top 150 holders. I'm going to briefly uh, give you more or less a, a you know quick overview. Um, so Bubble Maps focuses on showing the top 150 holders for any token. Uh, the way we display this is by showing a form of bubbles. So each bubble represents a holder or a wallet. Uh, whenever there is a transfer between you know, these holders, uh, whether it's on Ethereum or Life Peer uh, token, uh, these wallets get connected. And that connection basically, uh, it's the representation of the transactions between your top holders. Uh, it's a good way to find, uh, you know, man uh, wallet manipulation or any other like transactions. Like whenever there is a, a new release on tokens, do you know that there is a, a airdrops, there is a giveaways. Uh, all of these can be found um, through this visual tool that we've created. Um, our focus here was mainly uh, to help everyone to do the due diligence. As you know, most tokens or most uh, most projects focus on audits uh, that are more based on errors on the code and sustainability, uh, which this covers a large array of uh, vulnerabilities. But it's uh, you know we believe uh, Bubble Maps that this is uh, not enough to protect investors. As you know, uh, there is a lot of uh, a lot of uh, trading, that, trade washing that has been done, whether it's on NFTs or any other tokens. Um, we believe that having, you know, the, the correct data or visual representation of the tokens uh, distribution, it's a good way to show uh, transparency to the communities and to the future investors. Uh, as a way of, uh, you know, through this colorful and interactive data visualization tool that we've created. Um, that's more or less what it is, uh, what, what we do, and uh, we plan to expand. We are adding some more, um, uh, more features. We're going to do a historical uh, bubble maps so that it shows a full grown, uh, like the full from start to, to nowadays, uh, the token growth and distribution, how it has evolved and how it started to where it has been, uh, to where it's now, where it is at now. 
um, that I'm excited for that. I, uh, you know, to see how the evolution for any token, like anything that I want to invest on or anything like that, that's a big, big step. Uh, especially when you're trying to um, trade those whales or or trade those, uh, you know, if you find out that there is a wallet that has been done, um, you know, some trade washing somewhere else, you can easily uh, be aware of the wallet and try to find it on your own project to see if it's uh, if they're also in, investing on yours. Uh, it, it's we're building some more tools for not only for the end customer but also for the teams uh, to be able to uh, have a better security as far as their investors and and you know just any uh, anything that relates to trade washing or just being aware of the security and transparency um, of the token's health and growth. I wanted to display it, but I don't think I have option to share my screen here, I believe. No, no, not unfortunately not on stages. Perfect. So, yeah. I'm, I'm... And, um, Mm -hmm. The replay of this it has me playing around on it and uh, and, and showcasing it. So if anyone's watching this uh, afterwards, uh, they've been they've been seeing what I've been up to. Okay, great, great, great. So perfect. So uh, the I would say uh, we would love to have you guys on our platform. I know that you guys have um, you are migrating to another uh, network, I believe, uh, Arbitrum. Yeah, we've already migrated. So. Um... 99% of active people on Arbitrum now. So the uh, ETH, the ETH leftover, the ETH dust of live peer is basically just um, pe people that, yeah, haven't really done much or since since the migration or or basically just like exchanges that still hold it on L1. Got it. Got it. Um... Well, I mean, uh, like I said, there there is also something we can do eventually as uh, as we grow. We are uh, at the moment we are jumping into uh, building more on other networks. There is a pipeline of networks that are already uh, ready to be announced. Um, and uh, hey, I mean, if we manage to work out a deal with um, uh, what's their name, uh, Trivian? Arbitrum, man. Yeah. Uh, Arbitrum, yes, I believe. Yeah, Arbitrum, perhaps we can uh, help you guys join afterwards. But I think that uh, even now, even if you have a few, you know, that 10% could benefit from, you know, showing what who is there still, perhaps they can, uh, I don't know, help you move them eventually to Arbitrum. It's very, it's very cool. I'm kind of curious. So what do you what do you need in order to gather this information? Are you guys reading it directly on chain, or are you using a um, someone like the graph to uh, curate this uh, this data? Uh, we're reading off directly uh, of the BSC. Uh, in this case, Ethereum scan. Um, that's where we're basically routing all these data at the moment. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so would you would you not be able then just to use RB scan um and and basically port that over? Wouldn't it be pretty simple? Um it could be I think there is some complexity uh, some complexity to the tools um but also let me uh, I have to talk to the team and see uh, what can be done. We also have to contact the arbitrary team as well to see if they will be willing to work with us on this. Um, because at the same time, I mean, we just, uh, we want to have the support of those networks as well. You know, we, we want to jump on those networks and be having their support, uh, as part of the, you know, the, the strategy to jump onto an another network as what we've been doing in the, in the past and what we got going on. Um, like I mentioned, we have a couple of, uh, networks we're working with and we're being fully supported by all of them. So it would be a good idea. I mean, a cool uh, conversation to have with the Arbitrum team and then, you know, see where that progress. Uh, if if that could be managed to be done, I would say that target date could be end of uh, uh, maybe fourth quarter of the year uh, because at the moment we have a, a big pipeline 
um, already with other networks. So, yeah, I think it could be possible for sure. Yeah, would you do you prior what what networks do you prioritize over Ethereum? Um, when and do you consider Arbitrum its own network, even though it's just a roll up of Ethereum? Right. Um, at the moment, uh, I, I I'm not sure I can disclose many, but I, I could just give you one uh, that that we're working with. It's we're working with crypto, and uh, we're eventually gonna have a few others that are in the pipeline already. Um, also as as big as as crypto so um at chronos uh, so we'll uh we'll i mean we can see what else uh can be done if we can fast speed uh arbitrum into our networks set up networks maybe we could do that um i have to i have to check with the team as well first uh there's a lot more that goes in. I'm not like the technical guy. I'm just like a business developer for them, uh, with them. So I'm not very technical in this sense. Uh, I would have to double check with our techs uh, and, and tell you, give you more information later on. But at the moment, I, I know that there is a big uh, pipeline of uh, networks that we've, we're deploying soon. Very cool. Yeah, as soon as you guys do uh ethereum roll-ups then um yeah you can definitely count us and i think you have pretty good support from the community yeah awesome awesome yeah, i appreciate yeah. you uh appreciate you giving me the time as well to showcase uh you know and speak a little more about bubble maps to to your community and as well uh, i mean this could also work for anybody that is trying to invest on other coins or or nft projects as well um we have a uh we, we currently have a, a subscription per se, almost like um, a way of uh, having access to all the data. At the moment, if you go to our website, you only see listed tokens, but you could, if you are, if you become a premium uh, user, uh, you then become, uh, you will be able to access to every single, um, a coin that's out there on both uh, BSC and uh, Ethereum. So I'm just searching through here and I don't see the graph listed. Is there a reason reason why the graph isn't on there? For for life peer? For no, the graph which is uh, an Ethereum token. Uh the graph. Um oh, they haven't let me see. I, I don't think we have reached out to them yet. Hmm. Great community, by the way. I would highly recommend reaching out to them. They, we uh, we curate all of our data um, off the from the graph. Um, okay. So all of our data is basically hosted on the graph, and we we pull our data from them because they're a Web three solution for for uh, data indexing, right? Gotcha. Yes. Um, interesting. Um, I'm hey. surprised no one has reached out from my team. I just checked my database, and yes, indeed, they they're not. Uh, a part of uh, our listing well let me uh that's a great opportunity i'm gonna try to see if i can uh work with them and see you know where it goes very good yeah i think they're uh, they're sitting around number 58 on coin market cap so they're they're uh they're up there great team great community i would highly and i'm i'm actually really curious as to see what their token distribution looks like because they are um very similar in the way LivePeer works, um, in their fundamentals and their their methodologies and and uh, community, um, and we we use them and and um, so I yeah I would be really curious to uh, compare that type of project with obviously a lot of these like NFT kind of pumps you know kind of curious yeah. yeah. I could um I could send you uh DM you a, a screenshot of their of their token distribution at the moment, um for you and or if you wanna just if you want me to display or just show it to you on the main channel it's fine as well. Sure. Um, but it looks it looks pretty clean. It looks very healthy to be honest. Um, we at Bubble Maps don't like to see many connections on. On the token on the bubbles you know uh so we tend to say that bo the boring it is the better it is and they are they seem to be pretty <laughs> pretty boring <laughs> oh wait so you want less connections on the bubbles like you want you want individual bubbles to be separated 
essentially uh yes it's an ideal i mean we understand that there is uh you know there is going to be connections when there is like a wallet that pertains to a, an exchange like coinbase or binance uh, then you are doomed to have connection regardless uh, as well as when you have a wallet that is a a contract then there's another type of uh, wallet that will have connections but when you see connections between holders uh, that own like, you know, like three to five percent, uh, that's a little bit risky depending on, on who they are. Uh, it could be that it's a big investor that, that bought that percentage or, you know, we've seen tokens where um, there is a big cluster of connections and the distribution alone is, uh, you know, it's past 25 percent. Then that's a little risky. That's that represents to us a little uh, danger, just because that person could have bought that twenty five percent of the one wallet and distributed it to other wallets to hide away a little bit of the ownership that they have. Um, and we've seen that in the past where we found uh, you know a token that rugged. Um, the distribution on the cluster was like forty seven percent, forty five percent, and days after that token rugged. So. Um, yeah, uh, the better, the, the, the less cluster of clusters on the map, the better it is, the healthier it is. Um, we so, understand that. They so, will, just, to, just to clear, sorry to cut you off. So you, no. you say you want, you want lots of little, you want lots of dots that are purple and very few dots that are actually connected and colored. Is that what you're saying? Well, on the, on the Ethereum... Uh, base because we showcase uh, the the maps on the Ethereum chain as well as the talk the native token like in this case graph token um, I can tell you that there is some more connections on the graph token than it is in the uh, Ethereum um, and that is because of course whenever you know people is transferring money for, or or that token from wallet to wallet then it makes sense. Um, because it could be that they're paying something or, or et cetera. But if they're transferring on Ethereum, like if they're transferring Ethereum from one wallet to the other and they're connected, uh, that could be, you know, the risk part because that's when they are either, um, you know, putting money from on one wallet to the other um, to, to purchase the token and then so that it doesn't seem like they are connected or they own that big percentage. Uh, that's the only reason why uh, we we tend to um, to like the, the loaned uh, bubbles instead of connecting bubbles. I'm not sure if my explanation was uh, was clear enough. Yeah, it was. Um, yes, yeah, very very cool. Oh, one question, Kelv. Um, I recently learned that there's there's um, like smart contract vault type things you can create. I guess I had to explain this, but you can delegate through like a smart contract. It's not your real Ethereum address. And does your does your system like pick up stuff like that? I guess an example would be um, there's a lot of Wallet Connect providers that kind of do like that. Yeah, that's interesting topic. Um, when they are a when they are a contract, uh, we definitely catch anything that connects to that contract uh, wallet. Okay. Yeah, I mean, um, the only thing here you 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 might see that there is like, for example, um, there might be like. Uh, not many connecting wallets, and that might be because the percentage of those other wallets may not be uh, representative enough uh, to be showcased on the top 150. Again, we're just showing the 150. Eventually, we have plans to expand a little more, um, and maybe there we could see a little more connections to those uh, contract wallets. Okay, that's good. Thanks. Um, yeah, it's, it's very, very cool. Um, very excited to see the graph and live here hopefully be added to that. Um, I think it's, I think this is a very great project. Um, to follow up on John's question, I get, I think they're called proxy addresses, right? Like I know a lot of, um, I know live here specifically, live Inc. uses a lot of proxy addresses to protect the identities of, uh, 
of individuals and the company. Um, so do so I guess proxy addresses would be the bubbles that are connected, right? Because it's like that there's an association between them. And so therefore, that is exactly what this is displaying. Is that correct? Correct. That's that's exactly it. Um, all all what I mean, these proxy wallets, and we usually um, these proxy wallets, we hide them automatically. So because the reason why is because we know these are uh, aligned or they're attached to a contract, and most of the time, even though they hold a big percentage, this contract could be you know related to a pool, to related to uh, staking. Um, so we don't want to showcase and alarm the, the community by showing them that big bubble, you know, that's going to be like the first thing they see until they understand that those are uh, wallets that have been hidden because they are attached to a contract, which cannot be sell off right away. Um, there is not, it doesn't represent a big, uh, risk. Um, so we hide those, uh, specific wallets for that main reason. And then we only showcase, uh, the actual people per se, or actual individuals that are holding the token. Uh, however, if you were to show, if you were to, to want to see those contract wallets, you can see those by clicking on the right hand side, there is a button to uh, unhide and hide contracts as well as wallets that pertain to exchanges. Uh, you can also hide those as well. Hide contracts, oh, how interesting. Yeah. Okay. Hide exchanges, hide contracts. So then you're left with just, just bag holders. Exactly. Just the diamond hands. <laughs> diamond hands and their crony, crony buddies. No, no, no. It, or <laughs> it, so essentially, what we're yeah, showing depends is, on what you're looking at. <laughs> <laughs> it oh, interesting, and so. Yeah, lots, lots of spread out dots with very few connections just on, so excluding contracts and excluding um, exchanges, lots of dots spread out without um, many connections is going to be your, you know, your organic distribution of like token holders. Correct, correct. Mm, very cool. Very cool. Yeah, that list. The less conjunction, conjunction, the better. And then, of course, is of course, exchanges are their own. Like, th this not uh, it, this not always a an indication of token distribution when it's on an exchange, right? Like, who right. knows what that exchange represents uh, and how many people, but. Correct. Interesting. Correct. I mean, at the moment, I mean, you will eventually, you will see sometimes uh, some connections, and that might be because um, you know there are some some good buys through the exchange. Um, but again, it's it's hard to showcase every single purchase, uh, especially when they are not uh, a sustainable amount to make the price move per se. You know. Very cool. Right on. Well, we're very excited. Does anyone have any questions for Kelv? Is there anything you need from LivePeer if uh, you get the go ahead from Arbitrum uh, to do this? I mean, it, I mean, do you really need LivePeer's permission or anything, right? Yeah, just the green light. Uh, I think right. at this point, I would say that I, it would be a good idea to have you guys set up uh, even with uh, Ethereum at the moment, even if it's only 10% of your token. Uh, it would be a good idea to start there, and then once we have a uh, green light from our return, then we can reach out again to get you guys set up on Arbitron as well, uh, so that you guys can make an announcement and you know just do everything that needs to be done. But aside from requirements, just the uh, green light. <laughs> Got it. That's awesome. Yeah, as soon as you guys. As soon as you guys release uh, the live peer one, either if it's Ethereum, I I think I know that everyone would be more ecstatic if you had it um, released on Arbitrum. Uh, we would love to have you maybe introduce uh, uh, do um, do a presentation on our community call. We do it once a quarter, 
um, where it's actually from Live Pure Inc. They put on a community call, and they'd, I'm almost certain they'd love to have you as a guest to do a 20-minute presentation. And and I know it 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 goes far and wide with uh, with people that are looking at it in terms of seriousness. So um, yeah, yeah, yeah. If you guys yeah. want to get that going, we'll definitely hook you up with a presentation to to the official from the official uh, Live Pure Inc. board. Yeah, let's do that. Let's make it happen. Um, I think that it would be a good idea um, to introduce it to your to your community. Um, again, at the moment we just have Ethereum, so we can start there, and then um, you know once our return comes on board, uh, we can definitely do a different AMA or a different uh, another uh, intro uh, meeting or um, AMA per se. And uh, I, in that case, I will bring in on board uh, our CMO or our CEO so that he can uh, do a better display than I do. <laughs> um, no, but they, they, I think they will be thrilled to be a part of that. Um, so I would invite them as well so they can jump on board and, you know, and see if uh, anyone has any more technical questions. I think they'll be better suited to answer those as well. Very cool. Well, Kelv, thanks, uh, thanks for joining us and welcome to the community. It's great to have you. Um, really appreciate your time to show us this. It's a very, uh, I just love the growth and the, the tools added to this whole ecosystem. Yeah, thank you guys for giving me the space and the voice to uh, speak out here. And uh, hopefully we'll, we'll be talking soon and uh, going on board uh, on that community uh, chat. Yeah, do it. Let me awesome. know. Yeah, we'll, we'll get you hooked up for sure. Awesome. Thank you. Cool. Um, awesome. All right. Well, let's uh, let's continue on here. Um, let's head into the reliability and performance board. So, um, yeah, this is uh, we'll kind of make this the next um, the next uh, at least thirty minutes. I'm hoping because uh, this is I think very interesting, and I think um, I did a little more work on this. So if you want to follow along, head over to the water cooler uh, chat uh, and click on the docs. Um, this is a Google doc I've been working on. And uh, the goal of this Google doc is to finish up an overview of what we want to build, how we're going to build it, and really ask for funds. That is the purpose of this, this build. So I'm trying to figure out where we need to get the funds, what what need the funds need to go to, and then uh, fund it, and then from there, um, find the people that may be interested in doing such a project. Uh, so if we head over to the uh, reliability and performance board um, doc here, can everyone see it? Um, is anyone having issues finding it? Uh, can they see it? That uh, looks good to me. Working over here. I don't know if you can see my cursor when I jump around, but um, yeah, actually, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah, this is there you go. Anonymous Hedgehog and Anonymous Rhino are watching. Okay, cool. So, uh, we went through this last time where we talked about the problem. This is all the same. Um, we went through this and cleaned it all up, which is great. Um, we talked about the solution and what we're going to add. Um, we talked about the methods on how we're going to do this. Um, so I think we're going to go with method one based on the, the feedback, which was um, we want to we want to modify the go live here um, uh, orchestrator to add a stream free of cost. Um, and the, we would add a flag that would uh, that would whitelist a broadcaster to allow one free stream um, into their ingest. The other ones were obviously opt-in using testnet. I don't think this is going to be a good option because it doesn't show what a real stream would look like on the mainnet, which is what we want to really compare. And based on Marco's uh, calculation, a grant to pay for these streams also probably won't work. Um, there's already a live pure ink that is doing their test streams that we actually technically win tickets from and they do 30 seconds and that's what they can afford. So yeah, I don't think it's gonna work. Um, I think it needs to be a free stream. Does that make sense to everyone? Or do you think that's a good idea is to allow a free stream? 
I, I would have no problem yeah. with that personally. Yeah, I think I think so. I mean, it's logistically, it's going to be interesting to get that to to work. Yeah. So this is the uh, so what I've come down to. If you come to the second to last, third to last page. Uh, okay. So this is live peer tech stack. This is what I I uh, worked on over the week. Which, when I mean week, I mean last night. Um, this is this is the tech stack I I have went with uh, that I thought of, and I'd like your guys' feedback on it. Um, so rather than building something that is completely new, building it from scratch, I figured why don't we leverage what we already do, like for a front end instead of building an html website with a front end and all this custom like we should probably just use grafana like we have grafana ninjas in our chat we've got grafana people like we should probably just expose the metrics of the broadcaster stream tester and then just let people build their own metrics on grafana and then if people want, like if broadcasters want, um, you know, uh, metrics to compare, like let the best Grafana dashboard win, right? So for a front end, does that, does that make sense? Is that a, is that a good idea? Uh, to me, no, I feel like it should be one clean central UI that any broadcaster can go to and quickly compare any orchestrator that's signed up for that. I don't know if a Grafana dashboard is what broadcasters are going to want to look at to get a, a good indication of who's performing well. I could be wrong, though. I like it. I like the feedback. You know, I, I, I'm sorry, but like, I, I can you give like a, a um, a quick like summary of what the the goal of this um, like what, what, I mean I, I know generally what we're in general what we're trying to do but since I really didn't hear most of the call um, we're like what what are the main things we're trying to show here or and, and um, uh, to to broadcasters I mean I know reliability but in, in what way how are we, I don't I just I don't know I didn't hear the part about how we're measuring that kind of stuff or what we're measuring so. Uh, if we head back up um, to the solution part, which is one page up. Okay. Um, so we, we know what the problem is. Uh, we've, you've been here for all that. So I think we don't need to go through that again. But the solution is a community-driven reliability and performance dashboard to help broadcasters with their selection process. Right. Um, and so the, metrics, so the metrics would include a live feed from each orchestrator. I guess this should be that opted in. This is going to be an opt in thing. This is not going to be a default for all 100 orchestrators. This is going to be an opt in thing. Um, okay. Um, so, the, so, the, so, the, so, so a broadcaster uh, could actually go in and view an actual stream from an orchestra. That's right. 24, 24 hours a day. And okay. so, what, what would happen is, you know, you go to this, this page. This is. In, in my head, this is what I was thinking, but obviously I like feedback, is this idea of, um, you know, a broadcaster, we say, oh, like, I like, I like the idea live here, but I don't know how reliable it is, and I don't know how good it is compared to Web2 solutions that I can trust. Well, you go to this web page, and there's going to be a list of all the orchestrators and even some competitors like Amazon. There'll be a live feed that you can actually watch and you can actually watch it live. Um, and then down below, remember how Media Network showed you like all the up and down and kill, you know, there's gonna be that of like the last, the trailing 30 day uptime, like how many segments were dropped in the last 30 days, what the cost was. And then obviously the standard metrics that live, the, the stream tester already has. So distance, up, down, um, and transcode time, that kind of thing. So, would the um, would would the delivery be done through? Um, I mean, are we proposing be done through uh, Live Pairs Content Delivery Network? No, um, I think the so this is again into the tech stack. 
Um, like the delivery might just be. This also comes down to like. These are the questions I need. We need to answer. Like, where do we want to um, host this? Because a twenty-four hour feed, we shouldn't have. We should probably should like to start. I'm not. I don't think we're gonna host it in like three regions. We should probably just start with one, right? Um, and then the question is, should we use a content delivery network? In which case, like, do we need to? Like, how many people are going to be viewing this? Like, not many, right? So, like, if you only have one or two viewers, like, you don't really need a content delivery network, probably. You could probably just serve it up straight from the broadcaster server. Um, yeah, no, the reason I was asking is I'm just trying to, like, uh, the, just more variables involved there. Um, so, I mean, if someone was to tune in to watch a stream and it's... Uh, coming through, you know, different um, uh, delivery networks. I just, you know, I don't know if that would, how that impacts or, I mean, because we're really trying to to uh, to rate the uh, the transcoding uh, reliability and, and, and it, having a, a, any any delivery network in there throws another variable in which could, uh, you know, mess things up. That, that's right. That's, so, that's why I was thinking that, um, like, let's pick New York. Let's just start with New York for as an example. We would, we would rent a VPS in New York. We would have a broadcaster send out a stream, receive it back. And that endpoint that that, that broadcaster gets is displayed on the front end, period. So you're not getting anything else except for the raw feed from that broadcaster node. Does that make sense? Um, I'm just thinking it through because I, I, so you're saying, so if I'm a potential broadcaster, I come to a, a web page, I start a stream, and then I see it right there. Mm -hmm. that, I'm, no, no, the, the streams are constant, it's 24 7. Okay, yeah, okay, right. So I guess I'm not under, I guess I, I guess I just, <laughs> I really don't understand how, uh, what, what the, I guess I, and I, I, I haven't read this because um, you just posted it, but I, I guess I just don't understand. And because I wasn't on the call, I mean I was, but it was missing big chunks of it. I guess just what the general uh, concept is, other than that, we want to be able to let broadcasters know what um, our performance and reliability looks like over a period of time. Um, so this would be for every opt-in orchestrator would be would have a live stream running twenty four seven that a broadcaster could watch. That's correct. I guess where I'm going with this, how important is being able to watch it rather than just having a metric that uh, that, that says how um, uh, what the reliability is? It's I mean, just a confidence thing. Right. It's just it's like you know, it's just it's it's the same as like you know, here, do you want to buy this car? Here's a paper with all the details on it. But like, great. But I'd also like to see the car, right? Like and, and yeah, no, no, no that, that makes sense. Right. So like, you know, I just think broadcasters come along and they, they see metrics, but they don't know how to interpret them into something tangible, if you will, uh, the, the final product. So, you know, if they got to, if, you know, if you get to a page where you say, hey, let's compare a stream from AWS to a stream of pop of solar farm. Here is uh, two side-by-side -side versions of the exact same stream um, between the two competitors. Here are your metrics behind them on the uptime. Um, there you go. Okay, now, now I understand more of what, 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 the, what the picture looks like, okay. Right, and so that, that is the idea. And then you can compare any two streams you want or any whatever streams you want and you can see the live feed you can see the quality it's tangible right um but then it also has the metrics of you know in the last 30 days solar farm has sent out the broadcaster node has sent out 45,000 segments and received 45,000 segments back so he has 100% uptime in the last 
you know, 26 days, right? And and so you go, wow, that's that's great. That's like, oh my God, like this is perfect. This is exactly what I need. Right? I got I got you. And then I guess the other issue then is, and you were starting to talk about it, is regionally makes a big difference. Um, you know, um, so how, how do how do we factor that into the whole thing? Or have you guys yeah. talked about that part? No, this is this right. this is um, this is what we're getting into today. So the, the so I've thought about this, and I think we just need to pick one region to focus on, and that is your example. Like it's it's going to be wait like you know the 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 current performance board is great because it tests from lots of different regions multiple times a day and it's supposed to give you like this well-rounded world view but that's like impossible if we want to have like 24 hour streams right so we should probably just pick a region that we all agree on and remember we have to pay amazon for their stream so we don't want to have to pay amazon in three different continents for for a stream um we're best just to pick one area and set this up. Um, so that's kind of what I was leaning towards New York, just because that's where live here ink is, and it's pretty central. Even if you're in Europe, you could probably view the stream without any issues. Um, and yeah. That's how I've been thinking about this architecture. Does that make sense? It makes uh, sense. It, 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 it makes sense. I'm just wondering sounds, how many issues are going to come up during this. It yeah, sounds really complex. It sounds extremely that expensive. Um, and that too. I don't. I don't know how. I don't know if Liper is going to want to pay that much. You know, like 24 hour stream from Liper and AWS as well. That's that just sounds like a lot of money. Well, when you when you say 24 hour stream for for um for live here all the orchestrators are doing it for free that are opting in so there's no cost there and the okay. ba the bandwidth cost of you know sending out eight streams like realistically how many broadcasters are going to sign up like or orchestrators like eight let's say the realistically sending in eight streams and publishing them for you know one or two viewers on the internet to watch like one vps could serve that up pretty easily with a gigabit connection right um and then and then so the only cost is just the the sir the vps rental and then amazon's comparison which we can build out later like we could probably just do that later as a comparison later on and that'll be a whole different that'll be a whole different tech stack because we won't have a broadcaster node quote unquote to unless we will i don't know can you feed a broadcaster feed through broad through live here into aws's ingest and then get it back i i don't i don't know um I think that this part of it is almost, it's like a really big roadblock and maybe it should be tackled last if yeah. tackled at, at all. You know, I, I just like this, this is a, this is a big one, right? There's a lot that goes into getting something like this working. I only assume. Um, so I don't know. I don't know. I'm a little stumped on that one. Well, let's, let's keep Amazon or web two competitors out of it for now. We should probably just focus on getting like a working version of live peer up. So, uh, built uh, HTML, CSS, Java script, front end. There. So, The idea would ha be to have what what might be a good idea is if because I have an I like you know like I have a vision for how the front end might look, um, 
And what I could do is maybe just like put out a little template of what the front end might look like, just like a HTML mockup, and then just have you guys start to like criticize it and build on top of that. And then we can kind of mold what the end product would look like first and then work our way backwards. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I certainly understand what you're saying. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I gotta be honest, I'm so lost on this one. I don't even really know where to start, to be honest with you. I've, um... So, so yeah, like, hmm. I guess I'm just not explaining this very well. We had a lot of cohesion in the first degree, uh, the first conversation. Uh, where we talked about the problem and we talked about the solution. I, I want. I should. We should probably wrap back around that. Like, is this a good idea? Like, like. Yeah, sorry, guys. Can you hear me now? Yes. Go ahead, Pon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't want to sound rude, but did anyone approach like Jarvis and ask what exactly does he want to see? Does he want to see that 24/7 stream? Do we even need it? Does he want to see like capacity of orchestrators what we got left after after using live pair? Because we would be like transcoding for live pair and for him. Or does he need to know what capacity of an orchestrator or he just wants to know that orchestrators are sitting there and waiting for him? Well, I think I think any enterprise level broadcaster is gonna want to know the uptime of an orchestrator and their reliability like as a key points, right? Yeah, so can't we use our transcoding jobs that we're doing now to make something like a uptime calculator? I know that not everyone everyone from Musk has a 24-7 streams going, but that could be used, couldn't it? I was kind of actually wondering the same thing. Is there a way to use the existing, uh, you know, existing uh, data to... to calculate like uh, a percentage of reliability or um, some sort of reliability metric based on what's coming in. But I, I don't know what metrics are opened and how all the, uh, what happens behind the scenes. Yeah, the thing I'm, I'm really curious about is what the, the core team is doing as well, because I know they have plans to change up some of the performance metrics. I just don't know what their, the plans are exactly. Like I also, I see they've opened up a few GitHub issues and uh, things are working on with latency and and other other things similar to that. Uh, and I just I'm not sure. Are they tweaking stuff as well? Are we going to end up overlapping with what they're doing? Yeah, I'd like to know that too because I do see that they're working on a new what they call the ETE -E -E test, end to end test, and I don't know exactly what that's going to entail. Other than I I, I got the impression at least at one point that it will actually send. Um, it, it 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 will do more than just testing the ping time from the orchestrator to the broadcaster. Um, it, right, it'll and... send like it'll get an actual round trip time, but I don't know how that's being done or. or um... Yeah, and and Tom just opened an issue I think three days ago uh, called low latency phase one, which is super ominous and has no description. Um, so. <laughs> so they're they're uh, they're doing something there. I don't know if that's going to play into like how performance is measured and. I think it would be really cool to get a, a more clear idea from, from the core team, like what they're actually, what their plans are for, for the performance metrics when they change up how latency is measured and how the whole workflow of streams is going to change. That's a good point. If they start changing things, that will really mess with anything we build. Right. And... And I know about how quickly things change. I mean, I made one year ago, I made a, a tutorial on how to set up an orchestrator. It's completely outdated now. Yeah. Uh, like even the staking part, oh, how to stake. Oh, like yeah. everything's different. Hmm. No, I, you know, just to be clear, I, I really like the idea of having a broadcaster centric performance board that gives some like really clear metrics and like real time stats spe specifically for uptime and reliability, I think it's a great idea. I just, you know, we don't want to take on more than we can actually handle and then this ends up being a, a bit of a mess that we can't clean up. Sure. How about this? How about we simplify it? Maybe, maybe we just set up a single broadcaster that 
broadcasts into LivePeer using the default selection algorithm and collects the metrics that are already default in collection, like your uptime and all these kind of things. And then we compare that to Amazon's version. And that's it. It's just one broadcaster, um, one, one fee, one, one, you know, just a 24 hour feed. And it just displays the capability of live peer as its default out of the box selection algorithm. We don't know who's transcoding for it, you know, all these kind of things. Or is that not what I guess? Jar I wish Jarvis was here because he would be able to tell me what he was interested in seeing. Yeah, I think per 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 orchestrator metrics are are what you know. He's not here, so again, we don't know. But I can only assume that that's what those kind of broadcasters are looking for. They want to make sure that all the orchestrators they're going to send work to can handle it, and they don't have to like babysit them. And and, and live peers' uh, position on this is that the algorithm should be good enough to work, and that orchestrator i mean the broadcaster shouldn't have to do this though right is did i, did I right like that, that, that should be the ultimate right? no that's actually not uh oh. from my understanding um it's actually the opposite okay. um i oh, know okay. i know yond eric in the past has said like ideally we want orchestrators to be setting up their own selection criteria we want them to be selecting how much they want to pay selecting specific orchestrators they like selecting how what distances like they want them the so the the default selection algorithm is only a fallback um i guess it, default wasn't the right one i guess using the uh well um the default uh settings for it but the actual um what but actually being able to put stuff in there is going to change you know who it's going to choose for you you know obviously you change the price is going to like knock a bunch of people out um and you know i don't know it, I don't know what other metric I, I don't yeah i mean so. if that if that's something yonden said then some a board like this that shows those stats clearly is is a not a luxury it's like a necessity um we're going to need something like that if that's how the network is going to operate in the future where orchestrators are making deals and creating their own selection selection criteria with broadcasters you know they're going to have to have something to look at regardless of who makes it, it it's going to have to be there right yeah like the idea was that broadcasters would would have like the idea was that live peer was more of a marketplace than it was a service and so you could go into this marketplace and go like like each orchestrator acted as if it was an amazon or a google right like live peer itself is not amazon or google like the idea is you can go in and go well i want to use papa bear authority nolan titan because I like them, they have good uptime, they have good pricing. And I, I will select those three, and then I'll use my other criteria, such as max price and paying distance and all these kinds of things. And so therefore, I don't have to consider the other 80 orchestrators who I just simply don't trust. Um, they have low stake, I, they, they're, you know, their name is Putin is a dick, I don't wanna be involved with that, right? Like. You know, so the idea was that LivePeer was a marketplace of people to do this work. And so you should be able to go in and select who you want based on personal uh, opinions and um, and um, criteria. Yeah, and you know, it's funny, now, now that I'm remembering, actually, that, I mean, that's, that was always what my impression was too. And then I actually made, a, uh, I made an issue a couple of weeks back asking for, um, uh, the ability to, to for for broadcasters to be able to select multiple um, orchestrators to work with, and um, I, I got to try and find it now. But someone from uh, I think it was Eli said, "Well, isn't that what the what our algorithm is supposed to be doing, and they shouldn't have to select them?" Um, and I don't think I responded back to that, but um, that that's where I'm getting that from. But yes, I've I've always been under the impression that, like you guys said, that that it that the the concept was, hey, we're all offering these services, and people should be able to select and work with whoever they want. And um, and I, I, you know, the thing that I also a little sidetracked here, but 
I mean, for, for a, a decent sized broadcaster, why aren't they going to just run their own orchestrator? I mean, is it really like, I mean, it doesn't seem like it's that much extra work to do. And then they, they know their, what they're, what they're dealing with. You mean well, broad? It's like a whole separate industry that those guys don't focus on, right? They just want to know that their the job's going to be done reliably. They want to focus on the broadcasting side of things. I'm sure some broadcasters will run orchestrators, but you know there are massive broadcasters out there that don't want to have to deal with that. Yeah, I, Papa, but I think it comes back to that thing where, like, you know, why don't these big companies just do it in house? And like, yeah, like some will, but like. A lot won't like like why don't why don't i host my own website for my company well because i don't want to have to deal with uh, hosting a website i'd rather just pay someone you know 20 dollars a month to host my website and i don't have to think about it and the person that's hosting your website is going i just don't see why they're paying me 20 dollars a month like they could just host their own website right right all right I'll let that go. I mean, I figure if they're already running the broadcaster software, it's pretty close to running the orchestrator stuff, but um, okay. But like, when, but, like, it, but if you think about it, like if you're gonna build out a, a, a solution like Twitch, like Twitch uses um, Amazon, um, Amazon service, I believe, or Google service, I can't remember. But like Twitch doesn't wanna s deal with content delivery networks and, and, um, and, and live transcoding and, technical hosting right they, they want to just focus on the front end the app the, the 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 user experience right so they always they always outsource um hosting of that kind of stuff so that that's the whole that's where live peer is trying to fit into um no i mean i i see what you're saying i guess i in my mind that the broadcasting and the transcoding is uh i guess so closely related um and does require so you know some of the same software so um uh, doesn't seem like it's a big stretch to to go from one to the other and i also the, the other thing was um as far as reliability goes i mean you're now talking about you can now control exactly where you're um i mean a, again and i understand that everyone's going to be different what they what they want or what they're willing to do and um um you know what, what their uh, technical skills are and all that stuff but um it just seems like for anyone who's like a big broadcaster, it would make sense to run your own orchestrator. But, yeah, but um, big broadcasters are not going to be using live peer. Like, let's face it, uh, Jarvis, I, I I love him, but like he has eight streams. Like, you could you could buy a three hundred dollar PC, and you could transcode all those national channels on one three hundred dollar PC, like. Like he doesn't need live peer. Like he's he, his 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 need is like yeah, that's internal that's internal anyway. Like I, I just don't think we should be focusing on national broadcasters using live peer. Like the people that are gonna be using live peer are the Picartos, the 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 the, the Twitch streamers that have three viewers. Like Wait, when when did Jarvis say he only had eight streams? I was under the impression it was a lot, a lot more. I think it was eight to start. Yeah, eight to start. But like, it, it's these are national broadcasting channels. Like, you know, like like, like put it this way: Twitch, Twitch has twenty one. No, sorry, total not twenty one. Two point one million streamers. Okay, I think two million of them have one to two viewers right but just just want to throw this out there but i i think people like jarvis and broadcasters like jarvis are a perfect fit for live peer because they're they're specifically looking for a a censorship censorship resistant platform um to get away from being restricted in their their countries or whatever nation they're part of um and that's why they're looking for these decentralized solutions and that's what live peer is so what makes a Picardo TV a better a better choice for live peer than Jarvis? Well, I, th I just think that Jarvis, like, they can buy the equipment themselves and just do the transcoding in-house, and then they don't have to worry about censorship because what they're broadcasting is already the end, the end product, right? 
Yeah, I guess that makes sense. Like this is this is the argument that like like if you if you're a national broadcaster, like why would you outsource it to live peer? Because you can just you know, host, you know, you they they own twenty thousand dollar cameras. Like they can just they can just add it, you know, they can just transcode on site, right? It's not a it's not a big deal for them. Like I think I think the the purpose of live peer was that you get ultra low cost cloud computing and that really serves the market for like for like niche underground like people that want to stream pictures of paintings or like DJs and- Well that that can't it can't be like that because live peer will never scale if that's all it is. And and live peer is supposed to provide scale, you know. I mean you could host your own stuff in house, but you might be capped at, you know, 40, 80 concurrent streams. I guess you could just keep building more and more of them. Um, but one, I guess one use case would be using live peer itself off chain and that would give you that sort of scalability, but it, it really is the system itself that allows it to scale in a very easy way to build out whether you're on chain or off chain. Yeah. Yeah. Thoughts? I, I, I mean, Live peer, these are just my opinions, obviously. So, like, obviously, like, but from my understanding, it was meant to, like, massively reduce the transcoding cost, the cl- cloud computing cost of a lot of streams that were otherwise just almost negative value streams, right? Because the high value, like, the Super Bowl really shouldn't be transcoded through live peer. Like it's one stream or like maybe there's like 20 cameras, but like it's, it's just too high value of a, of a, of a production to, to outsource to someone who like even Amazon, like it's like you need like 10 redundancies, right? It's just so important, but like live peer really drives down the cost of transcoding for like apps that need to scale up quickly that are, that don't have a lot of money and then can need to get to scale with like thousands or tens of thousands of streams, right? That are considered very low value. Now, can it switch orchestrators without dropping a stream? Do we have, have that kind of redundancy built in or? It's supposed to be able to. That's what I thought. Yeah. I mean, I may not work perfect every time I would guess, but, um, if if you had have that place in place too, some to some degree, it's actually more reliable. I would expect. Yeah, the, I think Live Peer has like a. Well, every stream kind of has a buffer, but I think Live Peer's buffer is like eight seconds, and so, um, as it's switching orchestrators, it can um, it it eats into that buffer a little bit. So if it keeps switching orchestrators, like if it really can't find one that can keep real time then you, you'll definitely start losing segments makes sense and on, on the other hand i mean we also most of us i mean you're supposed to be able to transcode faster than real time and most of us can do it considerably faster you should be able to refill that buffer back up too uh, um, once it gets back to a good stream oh. or a good orchestrator well technically you can't refill a buffer because that would require you to pause the stream That is, um, that's a good point for something that's live. Yeah, because if if the buffer is eight seconds, but then you eat into that two seconds by finding a new orchestrator, well, the live video doesn't speed up, right? It it stays live, and so now you only have two seconds of buffer, and and um, you can't, you can never yeah, actually yeah, catch no, back up. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a good point. So. It, it 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 account it allows for one I think it allows for one to two switches of orchestrators without a single drop segment. Um, but between a hundred orchestrators and the selection process, it actually drops a lot more segments than you'd think. I've I've streamed through Live Peer, and uh, the default selection algorithm is like not great. I was gonna say I think a Live Peer just needs to figure. Uh optimize the algorithm better to to take advantage of the things that we're looking for as well or that we're talking about now reliability things like that and favor those orchestrators especially if there's been a problem with the with the initial stream 
Yeah. Um, but but yeah. then what happens, and this is the this was the problem with the selection algorithm back in early 2021, was that the same orchestrator varies in numerous, gets all the streams because he does it so well. And he has such a, such a high stake. So then what ends up happening is nobody gets a anyone that's new that is just learning doesn't get a stream because it just gets sticky to the people that can do it really well and that have high stake and so then this was the argument back then was live peer literally yeah. decided yeah. to hand out streams to people who are not good at streaming just to get them involved and then they duplicated the transcoding service at live peer inc to actually handle the real stream. Yeah, no, and I mean, I'll, I'm gonna go ahead and say this on and something that I know is gonna get posted, but like that, what does that say about, uh, I, I guess what, what, what to be, uh, what we can expect from reliability from just the, the open orchestrator pool. Yes, but um, reliability has increased substantially since back then. So their, their method of encouraging new orchestrators by giving them tickets and giving them streams and letting them test, it has worked because almost none of us would be here unless there was some distribution of streams to lower stake does. Well, I think if we get this, um, you know, real time performance dashboard together, maybe there's an opportunity to drive the selection algorithm, you know, based off that a little bit more, at least within like the a given round or something. Um, so our current test streams, I've, I've been told they don't really affect driving of stream selection. I don't know. There's just some thoughts there. I mean, maybe there's even a way to integrate that that reporting in metrics into live peer itself. So it just organically produces that and emits that data back to, you know, some centralized list of performance. Um, I know we're still designing it, but uh, I have had some other thoughts on on that. Yeah, I mean, I know live peers not going to want to work on this, but it really does seem like something that would be um, better suited towards towards them than, in my opinion. And I'm not a yeah, I'm not a coder. I, I agree. I I think this is a core problem that is probably better handled by the core team. But yeah. I I know, like Papa said, is they're probably not going to want to do this. But at the same time, they are doing stuff with the performance metrics right now. So I don't know where where we stand here. But, well, and then the other thing too is, does this also then, is this in a sense saying like regular, just, I don't know, not regular live, but just using live peer in its default uh, mode, it isn't like, are, are we kind of saying that it's not that good, but if you really want good reliability, you got to go to the, like, you got to pick what you want. I mean, does that, um, I don't know. But, that, really but that, that's exactly it. Like, how could you assume there's a hundred reliable transcoders that you're going to randomly select? Like, oh, and, and that's just a hundred. Imagine if we increased it to a thousand. Like, why would a broadcaster want to even consider the thousandth per person who doesn't, you know, if it's an open permissionless network, that means there should be unlimited amount of uh, uh, orchestrators, which means that 99.9% .9 of the orchestrators that are actually transcoding are actually, you don't want them because they're going to be really crappy. Yeah, I, I agree. And that, that's kind of what makes this a core problem. Right. Uh, All right, guys, my, I'm back. Sorry, I've been listening in, but I have, haven't been able to speak. So I'm, I'm, I'm jumping in here now. Yeah, go um, ahead. Look, I, I think the part that we're missing here as I'm listening to this conversation is value right when i pay a thousand dollars to amazon to stream my stream i know i'm getting highest availability i know i'm not going to miss segments and i know it's going to be for those that can request it 1080p coming out on the other end whereas today if you look at the live peer selection algorithm there's no incentive to be better right like if i want to be better in a real marketplace i can charge more so if i want to say all right you you know the hell with 1100, you know, price per pixel, I'm going to throw it up to a thousand or, you know, 10,000 because I'm better than all these guys. I've invested in the infrastructure. I'm up always 24 seven. You're getting 1080p at the highest quality. 
re- near real time or real time, whatever the, the fact of the matter is, right? But it's the cost of the value that is going to drive the selection, right? Like, you know, to your point is buyers, you know, varies does it well. Well, guess what? If he's doing it so well, he can charge more for it. And that will separate, separate, you know, the the less performers, because again, there'll be a race to the bottom because they're not, you know, their quality is going to be poor. And then anyone that's of any value, you know, like that, that, that individual streamer might like and say, you know what, I can't afford buyers, but you know what, I see this uh, authority null thing over here and it's cheap. I'm going to, I'm going to jump on that and, and use that while I'm growing my little brand or whatever. And then, you know, when Twitch gets on board, they're going to say, Hey, buyers can support our load. I'm going to go with them. You know what I mean? Like, You'll make those choices, but it's a value proposition more than it is is managing it or supporting it or choosing things based on random metrics. Bada yeah, boom. I, I think we all, we all agree there. Uh, I don't think anyone's disagreeing that value is what what matters. It's but you know things need to be optimized for that value to actually matter. The, the value optimizations need to be transparent in the form of metrics. And I think that's the part where we keep falling flat is that, you know, again, and I, I talked about this maybe even before this conversation was, you know, going on was, again, think of it as an orchestrator that wants to verify your own infrastructure, right? Like I was thinking maybe it would be like a, a tool that orchestrators would, would pay for and that they would say, you know what? I'm going to set up uh, a stream to run every day at this time or maybe every hour run a 15 second or a 20 second, 30 minutes, whatever the number is stream through my infrastructure and send me the reports and metrics of my performance so that I can optimize my orchestrators, networks, GPUs, et cetera, right? To, to find out whether you have high quality streams coming out and then, you know, something like that could also be offered up to, you know, to broadcasters who also want to look at that same data. But I think it all starts with getting metrics through individual orchestrators and then through collective orchestrators to say at the public uh, uh, orchestrator level, how do they perform for a given snapshot, right? But the other part is that the thing I didn't hear a lot of was we need to collect this over time. So like you might be great with your performance, but you're down you know, 40% of the week because like, you know, Titan was saying, hey, people are leaving my pool because they're they're playing uh, World of Warcraft, so their resources aren't there. So like, if you're going to have those kinds of gaps in availability and uptime, that's the kind of stuff that broadcasters are going to want to see, but it's going to be sustained outages over a period of a year or, you know, or longer, right? Like, I think buyers would be the perfect candidate because he has the most data for the longest period of time to show. But again, what you'll see in his, as we saw over the last weekend was, you know, he takes outages too. So on an outage level, he may not be the best, right? Like uptime, he may not be the best. So, and again, that's all part of the value proposition. So I'm going to shut up and let others respond to that and see if there's anything to add. Yeah. I, my opinion is if if uh, you know if 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 the community wants to incentivize and attract broadcasters we need to be the salespeople for our own nodes and and we need to show that hey you don't need all 100 orchestrators and a selection algorithm to get good results in fact the best results are going to come from Papa Bear, Authority Null, Zodap, Titan Node, Pawn, Elite Encoder, everyone else in here that wants to contribute, that they want to prove that they are competitive. And so you get a list of soup, you know, 10 high performing nodes that you want to select from, or, you know, whatever your selection criteria may be. And then Live PR is more of a marketplace. You know, maybe maybe there's an app out there that goes, we're a 100% green energy renewable app. Well, guess what? The only orchestrator I'm going to be sending my work to is Papa Bear because he's, he claims that he's 100% renewable. 
there you go. Boom. And, and um, you know, the selection algorithm is, is not meant for that type of person, that type of app. And, uh, and we need a way to showcase that. So that was the idea behind this entire performance board. So the real question is, is this still a good idea? <laughs> I think there's I think, a lot of merit here, uh, but I yeah. think it's got to be pared down in scope. Yeah, I agree. I mean, one of the things like comparing it to AWS, I felt was like a nice to have more than a must. Um, and then, you know, how can we keep the transcoding costs down for the project? Um, so, and then, you know, you've got like regional concerns too from your broadcaster perspective, your test broadcaster. There you go. Maybe it just warrants another more in-depth conversation focused on a couple of those key topics that Lee mentioned. And well, at the end of that conversation, if we still have no consensus or uh, clarity, maybe it's not a good idea. Maybe it's just too much churn to, to bite off right now. Well, I'm a big fan of, you know, how to eat an elephant, right? One bite at a time. You know, baby steps. So. Oh, yeah, I love elephant. Yeah, dude. So. <laughs> so maybe, okay. So let's, let's, let's scope down, right? So let's, like what John said, let's, okay. Let's get rid of the competitor's idea of this, you know, comparing against Web2. Let's, let's get rid of that. Let's. Start with just um, do we want a 24 hour stream feeding into an orchestrator node to prove reliability, uptime, and cost? Let's start with that. Is that something worth working on? I think 24 7 is expensive, but what you need to do is there's got to be a way to have sampling at a high enough rate that could detect outages but it doesn't have to be expensive because we can we can add a flag in the orchestrator command line that says hey for this particular broadcaster right dash you know free stream this you know list a broadcaster address and this broadcaster address automatically gets zero way per pixel and so it's a whitelisted address. And so now this app that we want to build as a community, it has no cost for transcoding into orchestrators that want to partake. So that, that's a live peer coding change we're going to make? Yeah. That's, this, is the, oh. this is the idea that we would go into the, would, we would make a pull request to add a new flag. And this flag would... Any any broadcaster address behind this flag gets an automatic zero way per pixel. And so you, each orchestrator can opt in by adding this flag and whitelisting the broad the, this app that's gonna do this do this work. So this cost this is what this is exactly what I'm uh, this is exactly what I'm ra this is what the grant money is going to, right? I want to raise, you know, ten, twenty thousand dollars and you know 8,000 of this can go towards a bounty to someone who wants to build out this flag, right? Like, I want to I wanna employ people in the community to build this stuff. This is, this, is, this is my idea behind this, right? I think it's an excellent idea, Tide. So, you know, if someone here knows how to fork, knows how to build, build go, go live peer forks and wants to create a free stream um, broadcast flag, Okay, it's called a bounty. I put out an eight thousand dollar bounty and let let the community build it. And then the second half of it is, well, we already have the stream tester software in Go Live here. Okay, mm -hmm. I need someone to modify that to be able to do twenty four hour streams, monitor what's needed, which is already there, right? Uptime reliability. It's, we literally already have it available to us. So there'll be a bounty to configure that and set it up on a VPS. Okay, great. So we got a free free streams to people that want to add the flag. We got the stream tester software set up on a VPS. And then ongoing and then your ongoing cost, which is the cost of the VPS and the cost of web hosting a service. 
And then we've got a, a third bounty, which is who wants to build the front end web page that's going to display all this content. And so you've raised, you know, twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000. You've gotten programmers together and we've built something useful for the community. That is my vision for this. Um, does that make sense? Yeah, and I'll restate, I, I love that idea. You know, I think we're just trying to get through the uh, the technical hurdles of it all. Yeah, well, yeah, that's... But the, but the thing is, the technical hurdles are best suited for the people in this call, right? Because nobody knows how live peer works better than us, other than the core developers. But they're, you know, they're working on other things. And guess what? That grant wants to give out money. The grant's got a shit ton of money to give out, and uh, I think we should we should be the ones applying for it. Absolutely, I echo that sentiment. <laughs> but Zoop, what do you think about like the whole overview that Titan just gave? Do you think it's a good idea to to have like a front end that has a collection of orchestrators and and some good metrics that they can look at to make a good choice initially? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, I always thought it would either be an extension of the Explorer, like if it, if it was part of live peer that I thought that kind of stuff would just Explorer would just continue to expand and more of that metrics would find its way there. But because again, that's tied to staking, you know, like maybe, I, I don't know, I mean, we're looking at it from a broadcaster angle. So maybe it does make sense to have it separate because they're different people, stakers versus, um, you know, broadcasters. So, but the, the other part is how does it solve the, the problem with broadcasting today as it's, as they, you know, Jarvis asked as well, is like, how much does it cost for me to send a stream through? Like, do we even know, like we can, we can ignore the cost for our tests, but like if a broadcaster is going to want to run through your orchestrator, how much is it going to cost him to do that? And Maybe that's not related to this directly, but it is though. I think it also. It, I, I I thought it would be tied directly to it. That's why I'm saying is like, how is that part figured out? It's pretty. I think it's a pretty simple, pretty simple method. For each segment that comes back, one you know we know that it's 30 frames, and we know how many pixels are being sent per. It's all standardized. So you go. Uh, you know, each segment is worth this many pixels. And by default, this orchestrator charges 1,145 way per pixel. There, you've done the calculation. In the last 30 days, this stream would have cost you $35.72 at the current exchange rate. Right? That can be calculated. Why isn't anyone so evenly, why wouldn't anyone from LivePeer publish this simple calculation? Or why wouldn't like the price bot or any of the other things like we've asked that question directly to hunter and some of the other folks but we don't get that answer right like why are there why is there reluctance for the to give the answer but to, for, for what, an though? official like document it document the the cost to broadcast here's here's the formula here's how exactly and then prove it by you know run a stream through and see what the cost come out on the other end right yeah but that's our job but isn't that, isn't it pretty, I mean, if you say like it costs this much per pixel, I mean, isn't that telling you how, like, I mean, it's up to you to do the math. I mean, you're saying you want Look, to do Cloud the Cloudflare says work. you can go into their workers and run so many thousand, you know, compute cycles and requests per second. But do you, or do you have the exact number at the end of the month when you sit back and say, here, oh, I know the calculation. Here it is. This is how much it's going to cost me. No, you're going to run your workload through it. And you're going to go look at the cost on the other end and see what it actually was. Yeah, you may estimate, you know, you're going to try to estimate up front, but you need to compare the estimate with the actual, right? The actual and the estimates can vary. And I think that's where, you know, that's why I don't think anyone's given a definitive formula because we can hear estimates, but I, I don't know any actual numbers. Like if I send a stream to your point is it should be to the to the penny, right? You should be able to calculate it to the penny. Can we confirm that that calculation works when we send that stream through? I don't. I haven't seen any of that results yet. But I think those are the kinds of metrics that also, you know, blend into 
you know, I'm a broadcaster. How am I going to choose which orchestrator to go? You know, like if it's 1145, as, as, as a Titan pointed out, and, and that's a crappy stream, right? Or a crappy transcoder. Whereas buyers may be charging 10,000 because he knows he's got, you know, top shelf, right? So if he's got top shelf, a broadcaster needs to understand that, you know, here's the cost for top shelf. Here's the cost for crap. And here's the median, right? I'm rambling a little bit. I'm just, you know, trying to get my hands around all of this. Okay. It's been, it's been two hours, 10 minutes. I've got to head up, but, um, I, I knew that this would probably take a while, so I'm glad we got about an hour in on it because, um, as you can see, in the beginning stages of any of this stuff, the first thing we need to do is figure out what it is we're building and whether it's worth it. So, uh, yeah, I would love your guys' input. If you want to read through, please, Papa Bear and anyone else, please read. Yeah, I will definitely read through this read through it um this is literally um the first version of this so this is why it's on a a google doc and it's editable and you know these kinds of things so or might you guys might not be able to edit it but if you want to take notes um please send them to me so i can kind of put them in here the goal of this first step is to figure out the scope what we actually want, what the end product would be, and the funds required to complete it. So before we get too in depth into like actually doing it, I would rather raise the money to do it um, and then build it. Um, and once you have some funds, like if we have 30,000 to throw at this, then you can really start to make some headway because now you can start compensating people for their time to actually figure this out rather than just um, talking and and trying to motivate people to do it for free. Uh, I don't think motivating people to build reliable, robust systems for free is going to be a good idea. Um, especially to take the time to go and like I know Elite Encoder has has already forked the code, doing his own stuff. Like, hey, I don't know how how familiar you are with the code, Elite, but if you can figure out how to add a free stream flag and and set it to zero way per pixel. There's money in there, you know? I'm excited on that. Actually, you got my wheels turning. I'm, I'm ready to pick that up, like, right away. <laughs> yeah. And I know we have B79 in here. He's done some work right on that thing so, as well. So um, my goal is to raise the money for these bounties. So what I, what the end goal of this paper is to set out what bounties we need and how much they're worth. So... Yes, if you want to continue to scrutinize the tech stack and continue to figure out, you know, I, I always figure, you know, for a developer's time, you're looking around $58 an hour. Okay, how many hours is it going to take to fork the code to add a free stream flag? Like, is it 20 hours? Is it 40 hours? Is it, you know, is it 100 hours? Like, I, you know, I, I, I'm unaware. So, you know, what is that worth? To someone to do and how much time so these figures i'm trying to figure out um so that we could um you know first we have to decide if it's a good idea second we have to figure out how much money we actually need and then third is to go ahead and, and do it so if everyone's on board with that then um what i'll do is i'd like to make another meeting here on thursday again at the same time, the old the old live period, the old water cooler chat time, and do another meeting then um, to continue on this uh, path. If that works for everyone. For everyone, great. Sorry, what when was the date? Thursday noon PST or uh, three PM EST. That works for me. See you there. Okay, I'll make it and. Um, yeah, this this is. Am I going in the right direction, everyone? I, you know, like as a team lead, it's easy to sometimes just be like, "Ah, oh, we're gonna do this." Like, but like, I need to know whether like people are on board or whether I'm like literally just not heading in the right direction at all. Like, does this does this make sense to be going down this path in this manner? 
I think it's a really important thing to focus on quality with the network and um, improve, you know, that's going to help improve reputation and bring customers on. Um, so I think they're in the right direction with this. I mean, how we solve the problem, I mean, I, I you know, as we talked about, I think it's going to require some change to the live peer program itself. Um, and we should focus on trying to integrate as much of that into the core as we can, you know, without external dependencies. But um, I really think this is a good idea. Yeah, I, I think modifying the orchestrator side to allow a free stream and then utilizing the stream tester software that LivePeer already uses, it already collects mm -hmm. a lot of the metrics we already want. And then yep. from there, you can literally just pull it into Prometheus and then display that, right? I was thinking the same thing. Yeah, and I know it does like a couple streams at once when it sends those tests today. Um, we could e probably easily modify it just to like one stream constant and it would gather all that data. Exactly. So that that's, okay, so yeah, anyway, I wanna use, and then that's what came up like okay, if we can collect all this just like we do with orchestrators, then these metrics can be put into Prometheus publicly available. And then anyone can create a front end dashboard, right? Like anyone can create yeah. a, a Grafana page or an HTML page or whatever the heck you want, right? Yeah, Prometheus data store is probably a good idea. Um, my, my mind was starting to turn on like a, a RESTful API or something, but actually Prometheus is a great start. Right, and and you, the data you can you can add into your metrics, like for reliability. I don't know how the stream tester, like uh, this is another thing. I don't know how the stream tester currently checks um, receiving of segments. So like, but it's already there. Like, it already does it for thirty seconds. Why can't it do it for a day or two days or thirty days? Right. So yeah, yeah, we'll need a little modification of that one as well. Yeah. But like fork that a lot of that can be forked right into the program and then displaying it. Well, hey, we can come together as a community, build a bounty for it to have a nice, beautiful template, or we can have people create Grafana dashboards that they find interesting. Can you embed live streams into Grafana? Maybe. I don't know. Good question. I mean, I, I, actually, I don't know. I, I've just never seen it done, but I'm uh, certainly not, not my area of expertise. Yeah. A Definitely little, could build for that, though. A little, a little graph showing up time with a little stream beside it listed, you know, like, look amazing in Grafana, right? Um, but anyway, okay. I thought I had just briefly about, you know, we were talking about the latency where you have you know, say if you're like in Singapore and you're trying to broadcast to the East Coast you know, with your, your tests, um, maybe there is a need to set up multiple broadcasters. Um, I know we do have one metric on the Explorer that shows like somebody's best score region. So if we had broadcasters set up in different regions for these tests, um, maybe there's a way to, you know, send these tests based off their generic, generic like their best region that they're, they're in. Wait, maybe I don't know. We can think about that part more later. But John, I see your wheels are turning. I'm glad to hear it. <laughs> yeah. The hamster is running. I like it. Anyway, these are the thoughts I'm putting out. Um, my goal is to get people to work on this to get paid for the work because um, these are improvements to the live peer protocol, improvements to getting broadcasters on board, proving that broad that live peer is going to be reliable to a high standard because you can choose who you want to broadcast to. And I think, I, I'm pretty sure I have, we, we can raise a lot of money for this because we have a huge amount of community members chiming in on it. I mean, Doug even himself chimed in and was like, this is a great idea. So like, yeah, like, I think it's worth it. I just, we need to go about it in a good, proper way. Anyway, that, that's it. Uh, that's enough for today. Sorry for the rants, everyone. Um, this has been making my wheel turn, but hopefully I'm making your wheels turn on how we can actually accomplish it. Any other questions before we leave? Question, comments? 
Thursday, 3 p.m. EST. We'll see you for the next meeting on uh, the reliability and performance explorer dashboard. Awesome. Sounds good. Very cool. Thank you. Thank you. you See you guys then. Cheers.